Okay, let's start. Uh, welcome everybody, those that are here and those that are at home or somewhere else uh, connecting. Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Joanna Kelly, which uh, we saw each other and Marta was also there in a meeting one year ago. And uh, I invited her and, and she came, so she's coming. So, so it's good that I'm, I normally do this everywhere and not everybody comes. So I'm very happy that you're here, despite the, the, how hot is Madrid these days. But on the other hand, we have here air conditioning. So in a sense, it's good. So I'm gonna uh, introduce her. She received her BA in biology and mathematics uh, from Brown University. Then the PhD was in genome sciences from University of Washington. Seattle. She spent a month in McMurdo Station, that's called there, over there, in the Antarctica. Uh, and then was a postdoc at the University of Chicago in human genetics. So she, you have done a lot of very different things, I guess. And then moved to the Department of Genetics in Stanford University. And she has a L'Oreal, 2012 L'Oreal Fellowship for Women in Science, and and now it's in UCL Santa Cruz. No, well, the L no, UC Santa Cruz, <laughs> and and she's associate professor over there, and she's gonna, as I mentioned here in the introduction, she has been working in many different topics, but the last one, not the least, is our brown bears, and and. I, I leave you the floor, I guess. Oh, I mean, and here in your thing says something that might be important or not, that she loves racing sailboats. It says here, it's true, though. No? <laughs> okay, oh, welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation to come and I was very happy to accept it. And it is true that I love racing sailboats, although it's been a long time since I've raced, but I did go to the Ocean Race Museum in Alicante last weekend, so I love racing. Um, but I also love bears. And so today I'm going to talk about the hidden world of brown bears. And, you know, it's really, I think, impossible to watch a video of bears and not smile, right? I see you looking at the video and, you know, some giggling and laughing. Bears are incredible creatures, right? And this was video footage taken at the Washington State University Bear Center. They're incredibly curious and just majestic creatures. Of course, it's not just us that have been fascinated by bears, right? Bears have fascinated human cultures for many centuries. And of course, I couldn't put a picture of bears and their influence on culture without putting the Madrid coat of arms. And yesterday, I wish I had time to put it in here, but yesterday I took a picture of myself with the bear and the madrone. Um, and Berlin's buddy bears there. So, you know, you can see just the influence that bears have had on culture. And of course, right, Ursa Major points sailors home or to the North Star, right, when we think about, about this, when we look at the sky. So bears are really everywhere in culture. Of course, the relationship between humans and bears has not been always so um, let's say warm and fuzzy, right? There have been really complicated relationship with population has dramatically decreased over recent times. And so in this lighter green, I guess I don't know how to point because the people online, hopefully they can see my cursor here, right? You can see in the lighter green, the historic range, you prefer that, I just don't know. Can people online see the laser pointer? Well, I don't know. So. Okay, so you can see the historic range in the lighter green and the current range in the darker green colors, right? So the distribution of brown bears has largely decreased, and this is essentially almost entirely attributable to human influence on bear populations. Right, and there are still many current risks to bear populations. I, I found this EU population trajectory 
from 1960 to 2022. And of course, population sizes are increasing. Although this, this plot also did point out there's a tiny blip in 2022. But population sizes are obviously increasing dramatically. There's ongoing habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, hunting, poaching, and conflict with humans. The activity cycles of brown bears are also at risk due to climate change. And so I want to give you a little primer on what happens in the year of a life of a brown bear in case, in case you aren't sure. So we can think about starting with the active season, because I think that's one that, that is maybe most identifiable to all of us. Right? This is kind of when we think about normal bear physiology, lean mass gain, and mating. So that's active season. And then there's hyperphagia. This is in the fall when bears have a massive consumption of calories, and that's when the really important fat gain happens. So it's going to get them through hibernation. What, what I wanted to mention here, and one of the reasons I put mating, is actually there's delayed implantation in bears. And so despite mating happening here, implantation doesn't happen actually until uh, almost into hibernation or early in hibernation, and then the bears will give birth during hibernation. So hibernation is the time where there's decreased metabolic rate, slower heart rate and respiration rate, fasting and fat loss, so all of the fat that's gained during this hyperphagic period is then burned, and the bears give birth during hibernation. And yes, they are still hibernating when they give birth. But, you know, Bears are not asleep the whole time during hibernation, and I'll mention that again. So this is Luna. Here on the left is Luna in October, and here on the right is Luna in April. And so I show these two pictures of Luna to highlight how dramatic these fat gains and losses are every year. And this happens every year without negative consequences for the bear. Indeed, these are adaptive, right? This is important. If a bear doesn't gain enough calories in the fall, then they're not able to overwinter, right? Then, and they will starve and die if they don't have sufficient calories. So this is adaptive in them. I, I kind of wish this was the case for me, especially eating the delicious food here in Madrid. Um, yeah. So hibernation, as you can see, is a highly coordinated process, right? The bears go through this massive fat gain and fat loss every year without negative consequences. And so there's a huge physiological coordination of properties. And so there's about a 75, up to a 75% reduction in metabolic rate, reduced cardiac output. They maintain a relatively high body temperature. So it's only a few degrees lower than the active season body temperature. There's no urination or defecation. And despite being very immobile, there's very little muscle loss um, or muscle strength loss. Uh, also importantly, and something that I'll return to, is that the bears are seasonally, seasonally insulin resistant. So bears are insulin resistant during hibernation and insulin sensitive during the active season. Um, I showed this, I put this picture up, which is from a kid's book called uh, Bear Snores On, but bears are not asleep all winter. They're metabolically depressed, but they still have a circadian rhythm that's just dampened, and so they do have sleep-wake cycles. They're not just asleep. I learned that once I started working on bears less than 10 years ago, just admittedly, so I want to share that knowledge with the world. Um, so today I want to talk about two different things that we're working on in terms of bear biology, one of which is hibernation and some of the physiological and gene expression changes that are happening in hibernation. And then I'll talk at the end about some current work on bear conservation and what we're doing in terms of genome sequencing to look at bears both in the U.S. and I'll just give a very quick preview of what we're looking at in Spain, really just tell you some some of the ongoing work. So to start with hibernation. So as I mentioned, you know, fat mass is essential for grizzly bear survival or bear survival, right? Bears need to have sufficient adipose to fuel them through, through those six months that they're not eating, right? They're fasting for six months of hibernation. And sufficient adipose is required to produce cubs. So this is, relates to the delayed implantation. And so if a bear doesn't have a sufficient adipose stores, they will not actually implant and have cubs despite mating. So here on the right is a plot of, on the x-axis is maternal body fat content by percent. And you can see that there are some really um, large bears in this study in terms of percent fat content. 
and the birth date of their cubs is on the y-axis. Okay, so to orient you, bears that had 20% or less fat body fat content did not have cubs. No cubs were born from those females, right? Whereas individuals that had very, very large amounts of body fat, their cubs were born earlier in January. Okay? And this is important. I'll show you the next the corresponding plot. And I want to point out that bears usually have twins or triplets. And so you can see that in the squares or the diamonds. OK, so cubs born earlier are heavier and have a greater chance of surviving. So which means that that body fat, it's not even that you need to be over some threshold to have cubs. It means that the larger that you are, then the more likely that you are to have cubs that survive. So on this bottom plot shows, again, maternal body fat content. And now we have cub mass at 90 days. Okay, And so you can see that bears who gave birth to cubs that were larger in terms of body fat content, their mass was higher at 90 days. Okay. So this is all pointing out that sufficient fat stores are very important for bear survival. And I got this, this uh, picture of subcutaneous. These are slides that my colleague took looking at subcutaneous adipose changes throughout the year. And so you can see how different the actual adipose looks throughout the year. And you know, you're probably thinking that's not that surprising considering how dramatic these changes are. But the question that came to me when I was working with the bears and with, working with the student on the bears was, what are the transcriptional changes that are happening in fat and other metabolically relevant tissues, especially in hibernation? And so in partnership with the WCU Bear Center, we were able to tackle this. And so I want to point out that the WCU Bear Center, this is the Washington State University Bear Center, is a really unique place for bear biology, and it's dedicated to research, education, and conservation. So we were able to sample the same bears over time. Okay, and these are bears that are at the WCU Bear Center. And we sampled them in January, so in hibernation, in active season, and during hyperphagia. And we were able to sample the same bears, adipose, liver, and muscle. Okay, and so we, we then sequenced their RNA using RNA sequencing approaches. And we've made several different uh, studies with this. But the one I want to talk about was RNA-seq and um, looking at these three different tissues. So when we just plot the top 10,000 expressed genes on the first two axes of variation, so we're essentially saying we have all these samples taken at these three different time points from three different tissues, how does the data cluster? Well, we see that the data clusters by tissue. And this is really reassuring, right? A liver looks like a liver looks like a liver no matter when in time. We looked at like, OK, this was just the do we have what we think we have kind of a QC plot. Then we said, OK, we can now zoom in on each tissue and ask what's happening at different time points throughout the year. So when we look at adipose, and now again, take the top 10,000 expressed genes, and um, it looks like it didn't quite transfer correctly with the video, but that's OK. These, um, unfortunately, should, this should be yellow. These are red, and these are blue. And they're a different shape to indicate that they're female, and it looks like the circles just didn't come through which is fine, because now I've described it to you. So what you can imagine you're seeing is a horizontal block of blue, yellow, and red. And so you really see on that first axis of variation partitioning of the three seasons in terms of gene expression. And on the second axis, it's partitioning by sex. And we've, we're currently digging into this sex differentiation a bit more, and it seems to be driven mostly by just a few genes that are very, very highly differentiated between the sexes, which is quite interesting. But I want to point out on the next plot, which is, again, imagine these two are blue, and now this is a mix of red and yellow. Instead of getting the partitioning by the three seasons, we just see the fed and fasted states separating. So we see hibernation on the left side, and then we see on the right side both the active and hyperphagia. And now I think we're looking now at liver. So liver plays a very different role than fat does during hibernation or, or hyperphagia, really. So we see again, and then the second axis is by sex. And when we look at muscle, now you can see that it's much more of a scatter plot of all three colors together. And if you remember what I said before about muscle, muscle doesn't really change that much during hibernation in terms of muscle strength and function, right? Bears when they're hibernating, especially brown bears, if they're disturbed, 
they can just jump up and be very, very active, right? So do not go into the den of a hibernating bear because they have all their muscle strength. And we think that maybe this is telling us something about that. In terms of these global transcriptional differences, we're not seeing that seasonal variation in transcriptional variation. But in all of these tissues, when we look at shared genes that are down-regulated, down -regulated, we see that all of the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, right, basic metabolism is shut down in all of the tissues. And so the stars indicate genes that are down-regulated during hibernation across the three tissues. And what I want you to take away from this big plot of oxidative phosphorylation is that most of the genes involved have a red star, right? Showing that we just have this really big shutdown of metabolism during this time. Now we decided, okay, these are big patterns, but can we look in a bit more specifically to learn about specific genes or specific patterns within that? And what we see is that a subset of genes display seasonal trends. And so here are two of them. And I've plotted along the x-axis all of the three tissues. Here's fat, liver, and muscle. And then they're ordered by active hibernation, hyperphagia hibernation. Okay, and so you can see that each gene that shows this trend doesn't necessarily do the same thing in each tissue, which we wouldn't expect it to. Right, so here we see AKT2, which is involved in insulin signaling, shows a very dramatic decline from active season to hibernation, whereas a different gene, which is a transporter, shows differences in liver between active season hi hibernation, but doesn't really have any expression levels in the other two tissues. So we then said, okay, can we figure out what genes are differentially expressed between active and hyperphagia? Right? Just, let's see if we can figure out what's being changed just when the, when the bears are putting on their huge amount of fat and having that massive food consumption. Okay? And so we then just did a pairwise comparison of active versus hyperphagia. And we first saw that fat is the only tissue of the three that shows any differential gene expression between the two, two states, really, between those two seasons. And we see that there are very few that are upregulated and about almost 300 that are downregulated. We can ask what happens with those same genes in hi hibernation. And we see that largely the genes that are going up in hyperphagia then continue up. So this is the median line here in red in terms of scaled expression. So we could plot them all in the same plot. Um, they largely go up, although you can see the gray lines behind which represent each gene and they're doing different things. But on average, they go up. And for the genes that are then downregulated between active and hyperphagia, they continue to go down into hibernation, although you see that some of them go up. And you can dig into each of these genes, as my colleagues do, in terms of being interested in one or more specific genes. So adipose tissue is very interesting, and it's certainly more than just an energy, energy source. And I mentioned before that bears are insulin resistant during hibernation, at least in their adipose. And so then I wanted to point out that insulin is integral to adipogenesis. It's inhibitory to lipolysis and the bears are insulin resistant or sensitive seasonally. So here's a plot of some of those kind of important roles that white adipose tissue can play. So we then, in collaboration with the WCU Bear Center, decided on different ways to eliminate the effects of diet and season to try to identify mediators of the hibernation phenotype in adipose, okay? So we took two different approaches, which I'll tell you about, one of which was feeding glucose during hibernation to the bears, and the second was a cell culture experiment in adipocytes. So what we did with the WCU bears was fed them for 10 days during mid-hibernation, right here. So here's this November, January, March, right, thinking about through hibernation. We fed them just glucose once a day for 10 days, and we sampled the bears before and after that feeding. We did that actually in two different years, one year we replaced 53% of their lost calories, and then the next time that this was done, we replaced 100% of their lost calories during this time. And the goal of this study was to eliminate all of the other factors that affect hibernation, right? So day length, uh, temperature outside, um, food availability, et cetera, right? So we were trying to disentangle how can we get at the insulin sensitivity and some of those other hibernation phenotypes 
from every, everything else that's happening in the world that happens kind of from the onset of hibernation to active season. So trying to reduce that field of what we're looking at. Okay, we were also able to do oral glucose tolerance tests and other tests, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So we can measure glucose and insulin in the bears. And so here are the measurements of blood glucose on the y-axis and the days and minutes after feeding. So just for reference, here's day zero, right before feeding, day zero after 120 minutes, and then day three, six, and nine, we'll show you there. And these two lines are the 53% and 100% replacement of calories. And what you can see is not a big difference between the two treatments in terms of blood glucose levels, right? Not, not a significant difference. Um, and I want to put this in the context then of actually comparing it to active and hibernation. So here on the x-axis is minutes post-dextrose feeding. And on the y-axis is uh, glucose, right, blood glucose. And this is an oral glucose tolerance test. So this is exactly what we do in humans to measure blood glucose, to look at glucose tolerance. So if any of you have done this test, right, you drink a huge kind of very um, disgusting, sugar-rich thing. I don't know if anybody's done this. I had to do it every time that I was pregnant. Right? You drink it, and it's just disgusting. And then they measure your blood glucose after that to see how it's disposed of and whether or not you're insulin resistant or sensitive. Okay, And so we can do exactly this with the bears. And here in blue is hibernation, and in green is active season. So you can see that Bears are insulin resistant during hibernation and they're insulin sensitive and active. This is kind of what a healthy human would also healthy in terms of um, insulin sensitive. So you get a spike of blood glucose and then it goes down. Um, and so if you look at the red and the black lines, these are really interesting because the first time we did this study, we had replaced 53% of lost calories. And so we plotted this and we thought, oh look, we're restoring essentially half of their glucose sensitivity. It must be that when we give them 100% of their lost calories, it's going to look like active season. And all of these things are just driven by food availability and really glucose availability. So we did the second year with the replacing 100% of the calories. And what happened? Looks exactly the same as 50%. And so for us, this was really also quite exciting because there's something ingrained in the bears that is not restoring those active season levels just from having glucose alone. And so we're now thinking about is that other macronutrients? Is there something else that's happening, right? And it, or are these other environmental cues that are then restoring this insulin sensitivity there? So we're looking into that or thinking about how to look into that. So interestingly, feeding also increases the metabolic rate and circadian rhythm strength, and perhaps not surprisingly. So on the top is the first year where we did the 53%, and on the bottom is the second year with the 100% feeding. And I want to point out, this is just a shorter interval up here, so I'm going to just kind of talk about this bottom plot with the 100% calorie replacement because it shows kind of the active season here on the left and on the right and shows what happens over time. But we had fed bears and unfed bears in this trial, and this was really important for us to be able to control for just more activity at the bear center, right? And so we wanted to be able to disentangle, was it just more activity that was increasing the metabolic rate and getting the bears a little more active, or was it actually the feeding? And so this plot allows us to disentangle those. And you can kind of see a little bit that you know, maybe you see a little bit more activity, especially here in the unfed bears, but you see a much greater increase in the fed bears in terms of their heart rate, right? And here's a summary of that with the, the red boxes being the unfed bears and the yellow, and the, not yellow, blue being the fed bears, right? And here's, again, the main rhythm strength comparing pre-feeding, feeding, and post-feeding. And there was also a significant difference between the two treatments, at least uh, post-feeding. Many of, gene, of the genes, were many genes, reverse gene expression after feeding. And so to orient you here on the x-axis is just the difference between active and hibernation uh, genes. This was from our first study. So essentially, genes on the right were increased in hibernation, and on the left were decreased in hibernation. And on the y-axis here, on this part of this plot, are the fed versus, or not fed versus fed bears here. 
So here in blue, right, is these are any genes under this um, direction are decreased after feeding and above are increased after feeding. And so these here are genes that reversed their expression in the study. So I, I, there are many other genes that don't reverse, but we've plotted the ones that are reversed here. Right? And when we look at the upstream regulatory factors there, we kind of everything points or many things point to PPAR gamma, which is a known regulator of insulin resistance and sensitivity in insulin processing. So this was kind of an exciting finding where, you know, it's one of those times where you find something that is somewhat expected and you look at like, what's known about this? And like, oh, it makes sense. It's, you know, it's always reassuring when biology makes sense. Um, it's also exciting when it doesn't, but this was one of them, like, God, oh, this is awesome. So the second approach that we took to try and disentangle some of those hibernation phenotypes and insulin sensitivity phenotypes was a cell culture experiment. So this is um, our rep my representation of cells in a Petri dish, and we have cells that were sampled from bears during the active season in serum from the active season, taken, also taken from bears. And here on the right, we have the hibernation cells with hibernation serum. And that's, I'm just calling them active cells and hibernation cells for ease of discussing this. All right, so you can measure glucose uptake in the cells. And here on the right is this is a control fetal bovine serum and you can look at glucose uptake and you see no difference between the cells that are in FBS. And when you match the serum, so again, this is the match where you have active cells and active serum, hibernation cells and hibernation serum, you see no glucose uptake of this hibernation cells and a lot of uptake of the active cells. This was, this was expected and really nice that we can recapitulate essentially the insulin resistant phenotype in cell culture. We then can swap the serum and say, what happens with the cells when we treat with the opposite serum? And what's really fascinating is that we see really no effect on glucose uptake when you have active cells with hibernation cells but a very dramatic effect on hibernation cells with active serum. And so there seems to be a serum by cell interaction that mediates some of that glucose uptake response. So we could then you know, ask this question of, well, what's happening in the serum? What are the proteins that are in the serum that are promoting the insulin sensitivity? And you know, again, then the question is, is there, are there homologs in humans, and can we, can we ultimately use this information for human knowledge as well in terms of insulin sensitivity? So we, we took that cell culture experiment that I just described and added an additional treatment. And that third treatment is the serum from the bears that were fed glucose for those 10 days during hibernation. And so we're trying to see, does the, you know, feeding the glucose and, and bringing up that insulin sensitivity in the bears, albeit not to active season levels, but bringing it up, have an effect on the adipocytes? So here, you know, we have the different bears by color, serum, and then we only had adipocytes from active or hibernating bears. And we can do the serum treatments for each of those types of cells. And then we perform gene expression analyses as well as protein abundance and assays on the serum. So the first thing that we found, and this is just, this is what I've showed you on the previous plot on the left, just as a reminder, okay? So the first thing that we found is that hibernation cells are unique in cell culture as compared to any of the other serum treatments. So here, the blue triangles are the hibernation cells with hibernation serum. That's what kind of just HH, there they are. And they look different from everything else. And any other cell type treated with any other serum looks similar here. And I'll point out that hibernation cells with the glucose serum, so with the serum taken from the bears that were fed glucose during hibernation, look like active cells here in terms of gene expression. But when we look at that serum itself, the serum looks very much like hibernation serum. So this is a, an MDS plot of the protein expression now, and here's hibernation, here's post-glucose, and here's active season. And you see that there's really no, at least in terms of MDS, no difference between the hibernation and post-glucose serum, but they have a big effect in terms of treating the cells here. And so we used a kind of subtractive approach in our proteomic analysis to figure out what was unique in this post-glucose serum that may be driving this big difference 
in glucose uptake as well as gene expression. And this was led by my postdoc, Blair Perry, who's an NSF postdoc fellow in my lab. And we found that there are eight different proteins that have unique changes in hibernation. And that's as compared to the post-glucose feeding serum and the, hyper and the active serum, excuse me. And I'll point out, in case I forget, if, I don't know if I put it to remind myself as a note on the slide, these are all found in humans too. So these are all known proteins and several of them are already known to have effects in terms of insulin sensitivity and glucose uptake. So some of our conclusions from this so far is that, you know, we can restore the insulin sensitivity of adipocytes and cell culture by just replacing the, the um, feeding with glucose. We can restore some, but not all of the metabolic and energetic deficits of hibernation, and we can enhance the cardiac rhythm strength with the feeding. Right. Insulin resistance in bears is clearly seasonally reversible, and we can recapitulate that in cell culture. And adipose plays an important role in developing whole body insulin resistance. And fasting alone is insufficient to explain the in vivo insulin res resistance observed in hibernation. So thinking about this, kind of what are some of the implications for wild bears as well, is that extended periods of feeding, right, may affect the timing of the insulin sensitivity. So having a mismatch between becoming insulin sensitive or resistant and food availability, right, and that supplemental feeding may reduce the effectiveness of, of hibernation. And I think, you know, probably both of these are true, and we're currently thinking about how to study these in collaboration with zoos or other places that, that may be feeding bears through the winter and, and talking about how we could collaborate to answer some of these questions. And, you know, as we get more of a potential mismatch between uh, climate cues and food availability and hibernation, these are probably going to become more and more relevant in terms of bear health and, and wildlife in general. So what are we doing now? So we're working on disentangling all these different proteins, genes, and pathways that control the physiological states. We've done some work on looking at differential splicing, and there are numerous genes that are differentially spliced between the seasons, and now we're thinking about how to test ones that seem of most relevance to us. We also are working on modifying bear and human adipose cells with CRISPR-A or I to upregulate and downregulate some of those genes that have popped out as the most important ones or most um, likely candidates. This is all ongoing work. Um, I'm really interested in single cell sequencing to distinguish different cell types, especially in adipose between the seasons, because all, everything we've done has been on bulk tissue. But as you saw from the slides of the adipose, the cells themselves look very different. And likely, there are different players in terms of the cell types themselves. That, you know, these are just, some of these are just ideas for directions, not funded directions that we're going in. Um, and we want to generate induced pluripotent stem cells so we can um, have a stock of cells. So I also promised to talk about conservation. And of course, thinking, of, you know, it's really humbling to be here in the museum and looking around, just walking around and seeing the collections and thinking about biodiversity and what our work means for biodiversity. And so, you know, most of the work that I've done previously was all in this hibernation physiology, but I really care about biodiversity and conservation. And so we've now kind of added on to our interests looking at brown bear conservation. Um, and so one of the questions that comes up in, my, in our minds is, you know, what are contemporary genet what is contemporary genetic diversity in small fragmented bear populations? How have population declines affected their genomes? And if I forget to mention it, I want to mention it now, you know, think about the declines in Europe versus the United States and the pace at which these declines happen in the two different places. And this is an interesting comparison because the pace of the declines have been different in the two places. Okay. And then how have management decisions affected the genomes of brown bears and what management practices should we continue or not continue? Um, and there are some really interesting stories about management practices, which I have a little bit later. So the first thing that, that my group, especially being a genome scientist, did, and this was led by my postdoc, Ellie Armstrong, who's um, starting a faculty position next year at UC Riverside, 
was to improve brown bear, the brown bear genome really f with conservation in mind. And so we had access to the bears at the WC Bear Center, and so here on the left was our approach. So we know that ADAC was the son of John and Oakley, and so we combined long read sequencing on ADAC plus short read sequencing on John and Oakley so that we could have haplotype resolved chromosome assembly. And so that means that we could put together the maternal chromosome and the paternal chromosome separately. Right, so many unphased genome assemblies exist, and I've done a lot of unphased genome assemblies where essentially you just have this kind of collapsed linear sequence that represents both parents that's not phased. And, and those work very well, and I've, I've used them a lot and continue to use them. But in this study, we, because we had access to the trios, we were able to phase each haplotype separately and give us a more complete picture of variation. Um, and we used high c scaffolding, which doesn't add any sequence information, but it allows us to identify contacts between scaffolds and put them together into longer linear sequences. So essentially to get us to chromo, the goal is chromosome level assembly. And for those of you that might be interested in assembly stats, I did leave, I was gonna take this slide out, but I was convinced by a colleague to leave it in, um, that these are the stats from our assembly. What I'll point out is that, you know, there are 361 scaffolds, so there are still, you know, additional scaffolds, but the major 90% of the assembly is in 32 scaffolds, which represent the 32 chromosomes of the brown bear, okay? Um, so a lot of this also was focused on the Y chromosome. So we um, did our, that assembly and we have ADAC, who's a male, and a lot of this was to improve the Y chromosome. This was in collaboration with Sarah Carey and Alec Harkness at Hudson Alpha. And there were a couple of reasons why we wanted the Y. So one of those big reasons is that the annual home range of male bears is at least three times bigger than those of female bears, right? So there's clearly strong male biased migration. And I found this, this study that had collared six bears in Europe. And so each of them is labeled with a color. And you can see that for the most part, five of the six stay within, let's say a hundred kilometer range. That's still large when you're thinking about movement. But then we have this one bear that like traversed many different countries, right? And has a huge range. So you can see why we might be interested in the Y chromosome and the movement of bears because of this male bias dispersal. So the way that we approached finding the Y chromosome in our assembly, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it, was to look for a peak of Weimers. So what is a Weimer? A Weimer is essentially a short segment of DNA, like a, we call it like a Kmer, if we're not talking about the Y. So just a short segment of DNA, and we're calling the Weimers ones that are just found on the Y chromosome or in males. So we used short read data from individuals where we knew their sex, male and female, and we generated all of the short reads that we could, essentially broke up all of the data into really short, let's say, we'll pick a number right, 21 base pair fragments, okay? And then we said, which 21 base pair fragments are only found in males? Okay, and then we have a set of them. And then we say, okay, where on the, on the, on the genome that we have do those ones fall that are just found in males? And we can then look at how they line up there. And we see this peak of Kamers here on scaffold 35. Again, well, these are only sequences that are found in males. So this is indicative of the Y chromosome. And we can actually zoom into this just looking at scaffold 35, which we've now called the Y chromosome. And look at how those Weimers are distributed across that. And what's really cool is that it shows us where the pseudoautosomal region is. Because of course, the pseudo-autosomal region is shared with the X chromosome, right? This is the part of the Y chromosome that's shared with the X. So there shouldn't be sequences there that are found only in the male because that's shared with the X, right? So the females would have sequences there too. And so here on the left, well, on the Y axis is just the Y more distri you know, uh, depth distribution. And here on the X axis is just where on that Y chromosome we are. We could also identify genes that were 
uh, near the boundary of the pseudo-autosomal region. And you can see that there are still peaks and valleys, which likely represent you know, highly repetitive regions, potential collapsing of assembly there, potentially. Um, so the assembled Y, we had our X, we knew what the X was. Our assembled Y was about close to cytological expectations. Here's the, the cytological expectation of the X and Y from bears. And in gray is the pseudoautosomal region and then the sex-determining regions. We could also look at how that compared to other carnivores and what genes were around those pseudoautosomal regions in other carnivores. So here's our bear assembly here. And that, that pseudoautosomal region, the PAR region, was very similar in length to both the dog and cat assembly. Then you see that the sex-determining regions vary a lot in terms of length. And so this is ongoing work in terms of our Y assembly. So hopefully, you know, you've been convinced that our assembly is really chromosome level and that we've identified the Y. We have about 31 megabases of Y chromosome and then another couple of scaffolds that seem to be Y linked, right? They're somewhere on the Y, but we haven't been able to place them despite having long reads and all of this information because you know, the genomes are still complex and messy. And this is really exciting. This is about a 16-fold improvement over previous Ys and bears. Okay, so there was a beautiful paper that came out this year from Menno Zhejiang that showed global patterns of brown bear relationships. So on the top are colored, essentially based on location. These are where they had brown bear DNA samples from. And then they looked at autosomes, the X and the Y, and I will admit this Y was before our beautiful Y, so I'm really excited to reanalyze these data with our new Y chromosome assembly to see how they look. But you can see for the autosomes, largely, you get the colors corresponding to where the samples are from, right? And you can't see it. This is Spain. That's the Spain bear that was there. And here's bears from the US and the ABC Islands, Canada, Alaska, Kodiak, Alaska, right there. And then, you know, if you, if you kind of, what I want you to do is look across that and you see that the tree for the Y, right, looks a bit different in terms of color patterns and a bit for the X too, okay. All right, so our approach was to zoom in first and look at the US. And we end up kind of including a lot of this, but, but there were only a couple of samples from the US in here. But North American brown bears are fascinating in their history. So the lower 48 is this part of the US here, just because I'm gonna use the words lower 48. Um, a couple of times. So this plot was from a paper from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and in green are the resident grizzly bear range, and in gray is the historic grizzly bear range. You can see pretty dramatic differences. So grizzly bears occupy about 3% of their historic range in the lower 48, right? So I'm, I'm only now talking about right, the lower 48. There were about 50,000 bears estimated to be in the lower 48 alone prior to this massive decline. And by 1975, there were less than 1,000 bears in the lower 48. So rapid declines in terms of populations um, and population locations. So in terms of, whoops, sorry. In terms of current populations, so apologies, each of these was colored. It doesn't matter. You can still see kind of the outlines of the locations. So these are current population size estimates from known recovery areas from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So these are places where there are ongoing recovery efforts to increase bear population sizes. So more than 1,000 bears, but not that much more than, not more, like 2,000 bears. Um, so this is, this is certainly ongoing work. So our approach was first to create, is to create, a reference map of brown bear diversity in North America, okay? And so each of these circles corresponds to places where we have samples from, and this has been a huge collaboration between wildlife managers throughout North America, including the U.S. and Canada, and um, you can see the, the number in there represents the number of samples that we have from each location, and we have them from places in, I just zoomed in here so you can see some of those numbers with more detail. So we are, this is all work in progress. We have 309 samples, unique samples. We've sequenced 98% of them, and the goal was to have genomes that were greater than 5x in depth. 
so that each base was covered on average at least five times or more. And that is kind of this line right here. So you can see that we're getting there. We need to do a bit more sequencing of some of these individuals. And then we have 2% of our un unsequenced genomes in progress, but this is ongoing. Um, because we have our Y chromosome, we can actually look at metadata for these bears and see how that corresponds to the Y chromosome data that we have. And so, you know, here are the coverage, here is each sample, and here's the Weimar coverage for the sex determining region. So you can see that these are females that don't have any coverage here, and these are males up here, and you can see that the metadata isn't always correct, right? And that happens. Um, we're, we're currently going back to some of the earlier notebooks and just checking whether or not the Excel table was off by one or if this actually was incorrectly collected metadata. But it also highlights the importance of if you have orthogonal information to check things, metadata is so important, but also is orthogonal information to, to have as either confirmatory or saying, hey, something was mislabeled. Maybe we need to go back to earlier notebooks or kind of is how is the metadata. Um, so in the first look at the data, we see that the Alaska bears cluster separately from Canada and the lower 48. And so this is just a PC of looking at the genetic variation. So SNPs and these data. So that was um, our first kind of exciting look at those data. And that we see that genetic diversity or heterozygosity is higher in Alaska. And this was from a subset of the data. So everything I'm saying is currently ongoing. So don't hold me to it. Um, these are separated by location on the x-axis and on the y-axis is heterozygosity. And you can see that generally heterozygosity is lower in the lower 48. You can see we don't have that many samples from the lower 48 in this data set. This was just trying to you know, get first looks at the data. Here's Canada and then we have Alaska. And what I'm really excited to look at is try and disentangle admixture from polar bears as a signal versus population declines in the lower 48. And this is gonna be really important for us to disentangle when thinking about the effects of population declines. It's, you know, Alaska's our great reference, but also there's higher admixture, known admixture with polar bears as you get closer to the coast up in Alaska. And so we really are gonna work hard to disentangle these different things to, to understand genetic diversity in bears in North America. So, uh, there are really interesting parallels, as I said before, between bears in North America and bears in Europe. So here on the left, that's, that's the kind of the whole distribution. But when we think about the lower 48, here are some of those population sizes on the left. And on the right are some of the population sizes and locations of bears in Europe. And you can see that in terms of population sizes, and I don't, I don't think I have it I had a plot that was on about the same scale, and I'm not sure if I include it later, but you can see at least in terms of population sizes, they're similar. And actually in terms of scale of distance between populations, there are lots of similarities. So this makes for a really interesting comparison about what happens with big carnivores in these population decline situations. Okay, so as I said, we wanna compare our work in North America to the extensive work that's been done on brown bears in Europe and hopefully contribute to that in some way. So there are known um, historic human-assisted long-distance migrations in Europe. And so a few Bulgarian bears are genetically identical to Romanian bears. And this was because um, some previous dictators liked bear hunting and moved bears between the places and airlifted them, but there's no written documentation of this airlifting of bears. Um, from Romania to Bulgaria. But there was a study done in 2014 by Noak et al. in conservation genetics that showed in terms of genetic similarity that these bears must have been moved physically, and there were other, other stories of this happening, must have been moved physically from one country to the other. So these are important things to know. I point this out because these kinds of movements of human-assisted movements of bears are really important when thinking about historical migrations of the bears and genetic diversity patterns in the bears um, or in any organism. So, you know, Spanish brown, that takes us to Spanish brown bears. And so I've been in Barcelona working on the Spanish brown bears through a Fulbright funded by Fulbright España. And here are the population of Spanish brown bears and their sizes, All right? So there have been dramatic declines in the last several centuries. 
Uh, in the early 20th century, there were about uh, 150 bears across the entire Pyrenees. And early in 1990, there were only about seven or eight bears in the Pyrenees. And three Sylvanian brown bears were released into the central Pyrenees in 1996, including Pyrrhus. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing Pyrrhus's name right. But Pyrrhus was a very um, successful male who essentially has thought to have now fathered all of the bears in the Pyrenees, all of the new bears. Um, the, now, I couldn't actually find the data for this, so if anybody knows these data, please email me. Everything seems to be kind of lore, and I'm really excited to see how this plays out with our Y chromosome data. Um, the last known resident bear disappeared from the Central Pyrenees in 2004. And in 2016, there was an additional introduction of Slo a Slovenian, several Slovenian bears, including other males, and Pyrrhus is now no longer alive, and so there are other male bears that are contributing to the population. Um, so these are interesting kind of outcomes of management decisions that may be unexpected outcomes. So what are we doing? Our current work in progress is sequencing 30 fecal samples from bears from the three locations. So we have bears from both of the Cantabrian East and West locations, as well as 15 samples from the Pyrenees, and we're doing a methyl enrichment for non-microbial DNA. So we're trying to enrich for brown for bear DNA in the sample. Um, we actually got the data two days ago, so I didn't have time to analyze it to show you, but it is in the works, and I'm very excited. There have been a ton of super successful efforts to increase bear populations in Spain. And so these don't have to do with the genetics, but I wanted to mention them because there's a lot of work that's been done in Spain on bear populations, including the bear augmentations that I mentioned, reforesting the land, reducing poaching, and also facilitating compensation to farmers. So to reduce the uh, potential impacts of human wildlife interactions. And there's also a ton of education that's happening in terms of um, brown bear education. And so I wanted to mention those really successful efforts that are ongoing. And so, you know, just to return to the question, we're really kind of excited about this direction of the project. I'm super excited about it and feel humbled to work on these amazing creatures and look at how have declines really affected the genomes of brown bears in Spain and in the U.S. and make the, these detailed population genetic comparisons between two continents. Um, and so with that, you know, I thank you so much for coming. I know it's summertime, and I really appreciate you being here, although I know it's hotter outside. Um, so I do appreciate you being here and being online. And I just want to acknowledge all the different people and groups that have contributed to it. As you can imagine, working on large, charismatic animals takes a lot of work and a lot of people. So with that, thank you, and I welcome any questions. Questions? Okay, thank you for this really interesting talk. I have some general questions. The first one is, are all populations um, hibernating? Ah, they vary in their hibernation capacity, and I, want, I forgot to mention that about Spain. Actually, there have been some anecdotes about some of the Cantabrian bears not hibernating. It's a little bit hard to disentangle food availability from not hibernating. And so uh, bears actually vary in their hibernation, kind of how long they hibernate, depending on what latitude they're at. Um, but then there are some questions about more southern populations, how much they hibernate at all. And I think it's still a, a little bit unknown. And also, if you think about, you know, look at the distribution of bears, like the bears that were on the coast of California, they were in Santa Cruz. I find it hard to imagine that those bears hibernated because food resources are available all of the time. Um, so maybe. When you put a hibernating population in captivity, do they all retain the hibernation behavior? Yeah, so they do hibernate in captivity, and a lot of that has to do with the withdrawal of food. So food availability plays a big role in this. And also um, having a comfortable place to lay down and bed. So 
the bears at the WCU Bear Center, for example, are provided with, so the food, availabil food availability decreases and that corresponds with day length and temperature decreases. And then also they're given straw and to kind of essentially make a comfortable place to, to bed. So yeah, bears in zoos are often fed year round to keep them active, right? So people are viewing them and those bears do not, kind of, they're more active. One of the things that we have talked a lot about doing and haven't done is are they still metabolically reduced? So they're more active, we know that, but do they have some still shut down of some of the metabolic pathways or not? And we haven't done that study. And so my next question is, how do you take these samples from liver, from living animals repeatedly throughout? Yeah, great question. So this is done in the same way that it would be done on a human. So with a veterinarian and their tiny punch biopsies. Yeah, so anesthesia just, and... Uh, yes, under, yeah, absolutely under anesthesia. So just like it would be done for you, right? You would be prepped for this kind of procedure um, under anesthesia, and then you would have... Well, you would have a doctor. The bears have trained veterinarians. That sounds intense, no? Like several times a year. I know these animals are large, but... Um, it's all kind of approved by the institutions, and they we've looked for kind of any signatures of anything from that and haven't seen it, so... No, I think it's super interesting that you can actually follow a living animal with such an intrusive uh, sample. It's quite interesting. Thank you. More questions? We have questions online. Uh, we have one that comes from the Alcala University. Uh, Aurelio Malo is wondering, uh, why have you not included brown adipose tissue, uh, given its dramatic effect on energy reserves, chain balance, etc., uh, on top of muscle, what, fat, and liver? Um, so there isn't very much evidence that bears have brown adipose tissue. I'm looking at you for the response, but I guess I don't know where to look. Um, wherever you are online. Um, so there isn't um, very much evidence for brown adipose tissues in bears. So there is some question about browning of the white adipose tissue, but bears do not seem to have, they do not use brown adipose tissue for their energy source in the way that small hibernators use or even babies. Hmm? It's for thermogenesis, not the brown, the brown the, one. The Thermo what? Thermogenesis. Is exactly, the thermogenesis. Yeah. But... Brown bears don't have it. Yeah. Uh, Aida Verdes, uh, that works here at the museum, uh, says amazing talk. Uh, and she says, how can bears retain muscle during, during hibernation? Uh, without physical activity and being insulin resistant, muscle cells cannot access glucose, right? Uh, why don't they lose muscle? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I think actually the muscle is still insulin sensitive. Um, and so the fat is insulin resistant. My guess is that the muscle is insulin resistant. Um, and we have some myocytes that we would like to study. I had a student who was going to start a muscle project but didn't. But I think what's happening is that the bears are probably shuttling different resources to different tissues to keep certain tissues active in like their brain and burning fat, right? Fat changes a lot, but other tissues still need glucose and other resources. So my guess is that's that change. Um, there's been some other groups that have worked extensively on muscle in bears and, and found some different interesting factors in there that, that reduce blood clotting and other things. So certainly bear hibernation is absolutely fascinating and lots of different things are happening. And then Alejandro Perez Ramos says a uh, spectacular talk. Uh, on the revolution of gene expression in bears, what genes are the most different between Scandinavian bears and North American bears? Leptin has a lot to do with these differences. Uh, so we, we've only looked at the gene expression, if I understood the question correctly, we've only looked at gene, express, gene expression differences in North American bears, in bears from the WSU Center. There, there have been other groups that have done microarrays um, on bears from Northern Europe, um, and largely our findings have been coincident. They've, they've, they've been um, similar. Hopefully that answered that question. <laughs> uh, not, not many, not more questions. So. Okay, I was going to ask you about thermogenesis, but anyway, since they don't have the yeah. brown adipose, there's no question about yeah. that. 
And now I was wondering, since we are in a museum, if you have been searching museums for brown bear uh, samples, particularly from places that would, they are not anymore there, like Morocco or whatever. Yeah, so that's great. So I'm really interested in the Morocco samples, and I'm not sure exactly where to... If there is any, anywhere. If there are anywhere. Um, so I have not... So Rob did send me some information about who to contact here at the museum, um, which I haven't done yet, which is why I kind of wanted to come here and meet and chat. Um, but that is kind of in the next step. So we'll... In Barcelona, we have identified museum samples there from that are from the Pyrenees that are before the introduction of the Slovenian bears. And so we're really interested in those samples and samples that, that are from periods before reintroductions. Um, I would love to add the Alice bears to this because there's kind of been, there's been a cut one or two studies of the Alice bears in terms of microsatellites and they seem to have um, some uh, I believe it was mitochondrial markers that were very different from other. There was a couple of individuals that were very different from other European bears. So, yeah, there's definitely, I mean, that would be incredible. Yeah. yeah. And I have one more question. It's about, when I was hearing from the, in the, one of the plans for conservation of bears in the, in the, uh, in Leon and, and something that it was that the males, try to kill the, the sons or the daughters of the, that recognize that they are not from themselves in the, of the mothers. They keep, try to kill them, pushing them. So that's a big problem. I mean, I guess you're, the way you can follow the parental and the, and the descendants, that could help. Yeah, and actually, that. I don't know how much bears, and, and so, you know, I'm, there are probably people watching this who know a lot more than I do. I don't know how much they recognize their own cubs because oh, females yes. will mate multiple times but males will go after cubs to get females back into heat right and so yeah of course this is this happens kind of everywhere is that that adult males will go after cubs and so females will they'll often like tree their cubs if they're going off to do something right so they take a lot of care of their cubs to keep them away from, away from the males. males yeah so maternal care is very important in that mm -hmm. and and females will actually also adopt cubs from other individuals if if let's say the mother is killed by something or disappears then females will actually adopt other cubs that's just a random aside but it's kind of interesting yes yeah yeah um well one more thing uh, and this idea of insulin controlling all this is that also occurring in all the other uh, mammals that have hibernation or yeah so so, so Small, so small, small mammals, ones. yeah, they hibernate very differently than, than large mammals. Um, the, the body temperature of small mammals goes down to the ground temperature. And then there are periodic rewarming of the, I, yeah, there's a slide way at the end. I'm not going to even go any further because I don't know what's between here and there. But, um, you know, if you think about brown bear, bears in general, drop their body temperature just a little bit. And small mammals hibernate by dropping their body temperature to ground temperature. Then they rewarm about every 14 days. So they have this very um, interesting body temperature graph during hibernation be, or during tor whatever people want to call it during hibernation um, that goes up okay. and down. So um, they do exhibit some of the same features, but the way that it's happening may, may be very different because of that. Um, I currently have downloaded kind of all of the data that I could find online from hibernators, including the fat-tailed dwarf lemur, some of the small, small mammals, um, and I'm trying to find someone who really wants to wrangle all of these data. But now AI, maybe there's just, you know, we'll see what happens with that. Um, but getting all of these different data sets together to ask these questions about what are the similarities and differences. The genes which, are recruited in the same way. Exactly. Are our genes being recruited in the same way for these processes or not? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Since there are no more questions. Uh, two more questions online. Okay. Uh, viewers are very interested. Uh, Alejandro Perez Ramos says, uh, do you think that metabolic control during hibernation is much more efficient in Scandinavian bears than in Spanish or Alaskan bears? The, the, can you repeat that one more time? Yes. Do you think that metabolic control during hibernation is much more efficient in Scandinavian bears than in Spanish or Alaskan bears? Uh, 
That's an interesting question. You know, I think like um, because of day, you know, temperature differences, day length differences, there the there maybe I could I could come up with a story of yes, certainly because of kind of how extreme winters are in different places and how daylight daylight changes are in different places, but without studying it, I have no idea. I would hypothesize yes, and it would be really interesting to look at. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Anna Laura Grandal says, a uh, uh, nice talk. Uh, regarding the huge number of cave bear remains in the fossil record uh, that presumably, pre uh, presumably died during hibernation, what could have been the cause of these deaths? Uh, some kind of metabolic failure? failure? Um, so bears that died during hibernation could absolutely, could be that they just did not have enough fat resources from the previous year and they just run out of resources. Um, it could also be that a winter is particularly harsh. And so even if they had kind of sufficient resources for a normal winter, maybe that winter extended and they weren't, you know, if there's a ton of snow and they're not able to actually dig through it, although I can't really imagine that. That's I wish I could retract that story. You know, it's like, I should have thought about that. But, you know, kind of envisioning situations where bears can't get out if even if they run out of resource and they're like, all right, I need to go forage. There's nothing to forage for. Um, so yeah, my guess would be maybe not metabolic failure, but that they didn't have enough resources going into hibernation. And this is seen now, right? That bears that don't have, or and organisms that don't have sufficient resources going into hibernation will, will die in hibernation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you very much. What is this? Thank you. Thank you.